Testing. Hello. Hello. Testing. 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 Hello, everyone. Hello. All right, we're going to get going with the fourth one. If everyone can sit down, please. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, so we're going to continue with the developer presentations. It's the fourth and final presentation for 135 Dudley Street. I want to remind everyone, after we have this fourth and final, we're going to have a short pause, and then we're going to have the one proposal that is uh, relative to 7581 Dudley Street. So please stick around. Uh, thank you very much. So Trinity Financial is uh, going to be doing a 15-minute presentation now, and we will follow up with comments and questions. Hello. Thank you very much. Here's Trinity Financial. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. My name is Kenan Bigby. I am the Managing Director for Trinity Financial, and we're very excited to be here today to present our proposal for 135 Dudley. Uh, we think we have put together a proposal that is responsive to the terms of the RFP uh, that reflect the hopes and desires of the community. But before I dive into the specifics, one point that I want to make very clear is that uh, Trinity Financial's approach to doing these types of developments is to truly become a community partner. We don't show up uh, pretending to have all the answers uh, to the concerns that have been raised. We have some thoughts. We want to share those thoughts. Um, but our very first order of business would be to engage in a robust community process uh, to continue the dialogue we've, we've started here today. Um, these types of conversations are what make projects uh, really successful and really strong um, pieces of the community. So for 135 Dudley, we have a proposal with several elements. Uh, one, we're including mixed income housing uh, at all levels of affordability. That includes both rental and home ownership. Uh, we're proposing a major arts and cultural component that includes 5,000 square feet of dedicated uh, artist gallery space, as well as 11 artist live work units set aside for artists, uh, and a 15,000 square foot public plaza uh, that will serve uh, to enliven the community, uh, to partner with existing neighbors, and to provide a venue uh, for cultural and community activities. We've included 9,000 square feet of flexible neighborhood retail uh, that we would work hard with members of the community uh, to shape what exactly that retail component looks like, how it can be additive to the community, uh, and be a place of opportunity for local businesses. Uh, we've including a parking component, uh, providing 240 parking spaces for existing businesses and residents of uh, Dudley Square, uh, parking for the new residents of the proposed building, and replacement parking for the BPD. Uh, we are designing a building that is uh, a passive house development, LEED Platinum certification, uh, with the cap cap capacity to go to a net zero building. So this is providing um, cost savings to residents, this is providing health benefits to the community, um, and really um, using cutting edge technology to address the um, problems that go along with fossil fuel consumption. And then finally, we have a holistic um, strategy for economic development, uh, for development without displacement, for local hiring, and for community collaboration. We've put together a team uh, that is uniquely qualified to implement these elements. Trinity Financial, as the developer, is a 50% minority-owned company uh, with a long track record of development in Boston, including in uh, Roxbury. Uh, we have a team that includes uh, several minority-owned firms, both design and engineering, uh, and a team that includes very qualified and capable members that have worked together before. Um, we talked about partnership. This isn't a team that's just been thrown together um, to a check some boxes. This is a team that has successfully delivered um, projects very similar to this uh, and would bring that experience to bear um, here as well. 
uh, a brief overview of the program. We'll get more into the design uh, later when we hear from the architect. Um, but what we're proposing uh, is a 240 space parking garage uh, building that is fronting on Dudley Street but leaving ample room for pedestrian friendly experience. Uh, we've got a ground floor that uh, activates the square with retail opportunities, uh, with the arts gallery that I talked about, and with the public plaza uh, located between uh, the proposed new building and the library. We see ample opportunity for um, collaboration in programming that space, um, both with the library as a direct abutter, um, but with everyone uh, in the square as well. Our housing uh, meets the stated goals of uh, affordability. We have units um, at zero to 60% of AMI, um, uh, one third of the units in, in those income tiers, uh, one third of the units at 80 to 100% of AMI, uh, so-called workforce housing, uh, and then one third of the units that would be market rate. We also, as I mentioned before, introducing both rental and for sale uh, 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 home opportunities. The parking is in a separate uh, structured garage located to the rear of the property and uh, as I said includes um, parking for the residents of the new building at a 0.8 ratio, uh, includes spaces for existing businesses uh, and patrons of the square and replacement parking for the BPD. There's also the opportunity to efficiently manage that garage to increase the number of spaces available to the public without increasing the size of the garage through a shared use um, program where um, residents that are parking that don't need the spaces during the day can make those spaces available uh, to the general public. There is also the opportunity, uh, if so desired, to increase the size of the garage to increase the number of spaces that way. Uh, and then finally, I talked a little bit about um, other aspects of our proposal that are important to this development team. Uh, it's not just buildings, units, parking, uh, and landscaping here. We are definitely uh, also looking to invest in the community and partner with the community uh, to make sure that this is an additive piece to the community. So I talked about a expansive community process that would be uh, day one, step one, if we were fortunate enough to be selected to move forward here. And that conversation would continue uh, throughout the development process. Um, we have a artist non-displacement uh, strategy that we would look to implement, uh, providing uh, dedicated residences as well as uh, workspace for artists. And we have some ideas about how we can make sure that the occupants of those spaces reflect the existing uh, artist community here in Roxbury. Um, we're including and uh, have plans for a robust marketing uh, program for our, both our rental and our home ownership units uh, that maximizes the availability of those units to existing families in Roxbury. Um, and we include resources to make sure that it's not just the uh, income restricted units that families have access to. We think it's important, uh, it was mentioned before about the wealth gap. Uh, equity in a home is a big piece of that wealth gap. And so we've dedicated resources uh, to make sure that existing Roxbury families can access not just income restricted units, but market rate units and begin to build that equity as well. Um, we've got a robust economic development strategy, um, starting with our uh, general contractor partner on this job. You'll hear a little bit about the programs that they can bring to bear to access jobs and subcontracting opportunities, as well as management opportunities. We're proposing an on-site management suite and the jobs that go along with that. And Trinity Management has a track record of successfully hiring locally and contracting with local businesses. Um, so those are the elements that are sort of beyond bricks and mortar. But I know the sort of how the project works is a big piece of this. So I want to ask uh, Fernando Dominic from DHK Architects to walk you guys through the design. Uh, I'm Fernando Dominic, and uh, I've worked with many of you here before. But for the last 40 years, we've had the privilege of working in this uh, neighborhood and 
you folks probably know a lot of the buildings that we worked on. Um, regarding the design, first of all, uh, uh, this site plan shows you the three main components of, of our project. The mid-rise uh, mixed-use uh, six-story building here, our plaza that we've spoken about before, and the parking garage uh, uh, in the rear of the site. Uh, we have uh, butters that are currently in operations uh, which, which we need to respond to in terms of uh, circulation. Uh, and this di in this diagram um, uh, um, shows you the operation of the police station into the lower level of the parking garage and then out onto uh, Warren Street. Shows you the, the entrance of the general public and the residents into the upper levels of the parking garage here and shows you the, uh, the uh, pedestrian circulation from uh, Warren Street all the way down to and along Dudley Street. Uh, as you can see, the first floor uh, shows you uh, the commercial uh, along the edge of Dudley Street uh, and activates uh, that whole space. Uh, it also shows you the community uh, space uh, adjacent to the, uh, uh, to the plaza. And it shows you uh, a series of uh, artist lofts uh, on the lower level of the, of the building. Um, it's a, a, a basic apartment building with a quarter down the middle. You can see here that the first floor is a little bit higher than the other floors uh, and uh, permits the, uh, a, uh, a studio, a loft for, for artists. It also gives great flexibility to the community uh, uh, spaces. I come back to this slide again to talk a little bit more about the community spaces and its interrelationship with the plaza. This is a kind of space that we're imagining as we think of what the uh, arts community space is all about. And as you can see, the plaza does a number of things. It's a landscape space, it's a space for activities, it's a space for open markets, it's a space that is also engaged with the uh, uh, community art space on this side. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Hank Keating. Uh, it's great to be back in Dudley. I uh, spent the years of 2000, I mean rather uh, 1993 through 2003 as the Hope Six architect at the Boston Housing Authority and I was involved in all phases of the reconstruction of Orchard Gardens. It's great to be here today on a, this really exciting opportunity and it's great to see you have so many great proposals. Um, after 14 years as Vice President of Design and Construction at Trinity, I retired and I've devoted my retirement to high, super low energy building technologies like Passive House and Net Zero. I'm on the board of directors for Passive House Massachusetts. Um, our team has designed this project to provide all the benefits of, of Passive House and Net Zero. So starting at the top, we, Passive House will reduce the heating energy by 80 to 90 percent reduce the whole building energy by 30% over mass stretch code, reduce carbon pollution into the neighborhood. This will be an all electric building. There's gonna be no fossil fuel combustion pollution coming from it. We have a emergency power, but that's the only, we'll have that. And this results in dramatically improved resident indoor air quality. Uh, a passive house has 24 seven indoor air circulation provided to all the units. Um, these are health benefits for residents and dramatically improve resident comfort, noise reduction. These walls and windows, you won't hear the bus station from living in a, in a building like this. It's remarkable. Um, no drafts because it's so air sealed and no cold window sensations because the windows are so highly insulated. It's, they're remarkably comfortable buildings. And it provides a resilient design. This is something that people are starting to realize about passive house. You can shelter in place. If the electricity goes off for a month or a year or, or a week because of a hurricane, you don't have to move out. You don't have to go to a motel because you can stay in the unit. It's, it preserves the heat. And then we're going to be adding photovoltaics to get this to uh, be a net zero building. Thank you. So we're running up on our time limit. Uh, this is just talking about the, how the components that we've described 
add to the economic vitality in Dudley Square. The two projects that you see on the right-hand side are examples of similar projects that we've done uh, in Dorchester that include these elements, ground floor retail, residences up above, and they're proof that this concept works and evidence of our ability to bring neighborhood retail uh, into these new developments in a way that responds to uh, the needs of the community. Uh, I do want to ask Brooke from Suffolk to just spend a little bit of time telling you guys about the programs uh, that they have uh, to maximize uh, participation, both jobs and subcontracting. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Brooke Woodson with Suffolk Construction. We're based in Roxbury. We built projects in and around Dudley Square. I just want to quickly go over that we will be working from the new Boston Resident Jobs Policy, which goals of 51% Boston Resident, 40% people of color, 12% females. How do we get there? We get there through the pipeline. We're building the pipeline of people from this neighborhood and surrounding neighborhoods. We're proud signatories with the Carpenters Union. We get people into training. Um, we're supporters of the Building Pathways program, which is located here in Dudley. Uh, we support the effort to get more women into the trades, 20% by the year 2020, working with the policy group on tradeswomen's issues. We're very focused on minority women business uh, utilization, and we, we run our own program at Suffolk. Uh, called the Trade Partnership Series, where we mentor minority-owned businesses. So uh, work, we have a history of working with Trinity. I also want to acknowledge my colleague, Derek Cherry, who's usually the project manager on Trinity projects. So we want to work with the community to achieve all those goals. So get in the hook. Um, thank you guys for listening. We can continue the conversation during Q&A. Boy, fourth and final gold star, 15 minutes. Um, Thank you, Trinity. Why don't we open it up to comments and questions? Yes, right here. Well, you, you come on up to the mic, please. That'd be appreciated. Hi, I'm Cynthia. You come right to the mic. Hi, I'm Cynthia, and I'm for Trinity. Why? Are you doing 125 apartments when we need more affordable apartments? So the number of units uh, is the result of looking at a, uh, a few factors. Uh, one, we need to make sure that this project is one that fits within the context of the neighborhood. Um, so we didn't want to do um, uh, a building that would dominate the square and sort of change the character of the square. So the building we've designed fits within uh, the existing massing and sort of feel of the square. Uh, second, we wanted to make sure that this was a financially feasible um, project. Um, these goals are only met insofar as the project can be financed and built successfully. And so we're trying to balance uh, the maximum number of units we can build against the cost to build that and the rents that can be charged trying to hit the various um, affordability requirements. And so it's somewhat of a mathematical calculation to sort of say, what can the site support both physically and financially? And we think this is the best approach. The last thing I'll say is we are open to conversations about changes that may be needed need to be made, um, but we needed a starting point, and we think this is a good starting point. Rodney, do you have a comment or question? Why don't you come up here, please? Thank you. Um, so what I didn't hear, Brooke, and I've worked with Brooke before, um, is this idea of a commitment around what is your utilization number. And um, why I think that's important is because the, I didn't get, talk, get a chance to talk the last uh, time out was because um, there wasn't enough time. But let me just say that the last team didn't have demonstrated utilization because I was on the CAC for Jackson Square, and in their paperwork, they did put 225 Center Street. And 225 Center Street was an abysmal project with regard to utilization. They got 1% on a $53 million project. And, and so when you think about all of these projects, what is the commitment and what is the demonstrated commitment to diversity around work, not just work, but around businesses? And, and that, we time and time and time again, we had to go through and be careful. And the only one, in my view, has been right up front with that, and that's been Cruz. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in front of Brooke to answer this question for one reason. Um, A, Trinity Financial takes... 
uh, participation both in jobs and subcontracting seriously, and I think you can look at our track record of meeting or exceeding uh, the goals that we set. Um, second, we require our contractors, anyone that's on our team, to have that same commitment uh, to those goals, to meeting or exceeding those goals. And we would actually write that into our contract. So there would be a contractual document uh, answering just the question that you raised. It wouldn't be a nebulous best efforts goal. It would be black and white on a piece of paper. Uh, to sign this contract, you need to meet or exceed these goals. And we would hold our team members to those standards and ask the community to hold us to those standards. So, yeah, so we are uh, at a minimum committed to the 51% participation, um, but have done more than that and would look at doing more than that in concert with I'm sorry, MBE, correct, minority participation and minority business participation. And I would say we would look to exceed that um, with a plan that makes those numbers achievable. We don't want to set anyone up for failure, um, but we would look to do more than the required minimum. Comment question right here. Come on up. Uh, yeah, I'm, just, I'm just curious. Uh, right here. A question to all the presenters. <coughs> what, what time frame are we talking about? I, I don't know if anybody's <coughs> addressed the fact that, um, you know, that uh, how far out are we talking about in terms of these projects being completed? L let me just make a general statement. For all the four involving um, the rental development, it would involve not only Department of Neighbor Development funding, but also state funding. So um, the state does their rounds every, uh, funding rounds every year. The D&D does its funding rounds every year, and we do them in the fall. So we would look for a, a fall application to go into the Department of Housing and Community Development sometime early 2020. And then it's really up to the state to work with us to evaluate and, and fund them. So we're looking you know, for at least a year. That, that, that's just a general point for all of the um, proposals that involve development of, of rental housing. Um, the home ownership, um, it would be included in that same proposal, so we're pretty much talking about the same time frame. It'd be t a construction start, um, the question is what was the timing, it would be uh, 2021, probably. Yeah. If you have a, qu a question, comment. <coughs> Greetings. Yeah. I'm going to be a pain. I'm Linda Freeman. I'm a Roxbury resident in Highland Park. Okay, when you consider all the development, and there's also, you have to keep in mind that they're doing transportation along, changes along Dudley, you know, all that. Um, good luck. All right. Hello. Come on down. Hello again. Hi again. Um, I just want to... Uh, for the for all the folks who presented, um, there wasn't much said about the library um, and the connection between the development potential development in the library. The reason why I bring it up is because when we shut down, um, there's discussion about how the whole area is going to change and there's going to be more unity um, in terms of uh, that particular spot being um, a community space. And I know that since we've been gone, since the library's been gone, a lot of uh, my patrons I see on the street are just like, there's no place for all of us to just gather and just be. Um, and uh, yeah, so when there's more private property, that often cuts out the ability for people to just be and uh, be somewhere um, and feel ownership of their place. Um, so um, I feel like there needs to be more thought about, uh, there's even the you know pictures kind of sort of just like cut off <laughs> the library there. There's no, there's needs to be more thought about like this open community space, the library's right there. How, how are you guys thinking about that? Every one of you I think needs to think about that. Um, thank you for the comment. We tried to reflect that um, desire to um, partner with the library as a neighbor 
by where we placed our community plaza, um, how we book mar bookended that community plaza on, uh, on the 135 Dudley property with the community arts space. And so we really do envision that as a shared space with shared programming uh, opportunities. Um, if sure. So as you see there, that community plaza is located right in between uh, the library and the proposed new building. Uh, specifically, uh, within the new building is where the community art space is located. And we do envision that as a community plaza um, with an opportunity for shared programming uh, and uses with the library and with the larger community. Uh, Fernando. Your, your point is well taken, and in fact, we thought a lot about the library. Um, as you know, or you may know, um, the entrance to the library is being changed to the other side. So we're expecting that this type of space is really going to engage the two sides uh, in, a, in, a, in, in, a, in a common space that will be accessible to, to the both of them. So while we haven't worked out the details, we do have in mind the... Uh, uh, the fact that we need to make sure that uh, we attend to the needs of the library too. Um, yes, come on. And then we'll go to uh, Bridget has a comment or a question next. Yeah. Good morning, afternoon, um, Nina La Negra. United Neighbors of Lower Roxbury and Roxbury Cultural District and Roxbury resident. Can you say more about Artists Live Workspace. So we've got 11 units, um, studio, um, artist loft units. There would be an artist preference on those units to make sure that uh, they are uh, ultimately rented by artists. This is a um, program we've implemented successfully at other developments and uh, the vitality that uh, an artist community brings not just to the building but to the surrounding community is one that we value greatly and so we would manage that process closely uh, to make sure that this uh, remains a thriving uh, artist um, housing live work and uh, display space for artists existing artists um, I talked a little bit about um, a marketing program to try to ensure that um, folks currently living in the community can access these opportunities, and that would apply to the artists' um, uh, units as well. The artist units are rental units, not ownership units. Luis, I saw a hand move. There you are. First question is about partnership, and I raised that for the first and the second, and weren't able to. But Madison Park Vocational Technical High School, what type of commitment can you make to make sure that the students there, the women and men who are coming through those programs, will be utilized in the development and possible in the management of the, the property? Second, in terms of the design space and the design scape, if you're going to partnership with the library, will there be retail and other activities in that plaza area that bring people in and it's also, you know, sort of makes it a common use so that when you say you're partnership with the library, there's opportunities for people to move back and forth and utilize the space in a more productive way? So to your first question, uh, yeah, we take community partnerships very seriously. I personally don't know enough about the Madison Park program to be able to give you specifics, but I can tell you that yes, we are open to and will do um, whatever we can to maximize participation there, up to and including resources, which we've included resources in our budget for community collaboration, uh, and it sounds like that's a program that uh, could be a, a good use of those funds. Um, to answer your second question, you saw in the design that what we programmed um, interfacing in the new building with the public plaza was our art space, not our retail space. The retail space is located along um, Dudley Street to address the square directly. Um, but there is flexibility in those spaces and we could look at uh, reprogramming um, as part of the community process that I talked about. Um, but again, we had to put forth some ideas today and what we thought and has 
uh, been successful uh, in other locations is a community arts use on a public plaza allows for maximum flexibility in programming that space. Uh, Suffolk has a partnership with the high school. Uh, we have an internship program that we're working on to give some of the students um, some employment directly in the, on work sites. We uh, actively provide uh, free safety courses at the school for the students, and we just want to keep growing that relationship. Bridget had a question or a comment here. I've, I've raised this uh, before. It's around um, community benefits and thinking about community benefits differently. Um, and, and certainly with an emphasis and a focus on our small businesses that we potentially or have the opportunity to collect rent from uh, these units or, or these new developments, a floor of these rents and put that into an account uh, which acts and serves as an, uh, a sort of VC or angel investment arm where we can support small businesses and it's, in, it's controlled by the community and it's into perpetuity. Instead of having these short hits of community benefits that have a short duration and then that uh, development team continues to generate revenue from our community. Um, so these, this is the reason that, uh, to me, the community engagement process is the first step in putting these developments together. This is a unique idea, not one obviously that we considered in our proposal, um, but uh, there's a lot to like about it. Um, on the retail, I will say that we have priced that retail below market rates so that it can be affordable to um, small businesses, local businesses. We've also included resources to help with the fit up and start up costs for those businesses. Um, but layering on some kind of um, renewable long term resource is a great idea and one we would uh, tackle and engage with to sort of see if, if how that could work uh, wholeheartedly. So we've come to the end of the question and, and comment period for this fourth and final, which would also be the end of the presentations for 135 Dudley. Uh, uh, before we leave, a couple, just on this, because we're going to stick around for 75-81 Dudley. Be, uh, before we leave, though, remember that you have a handout here to help you um, get a better understanding of each of the applications. On the agenda, if you look at the bottom, we have a, a site location where you could see uh, listed RFP, you could look at all the applications and responses. And lastly, or actually two more points, again, this, as I mentioned earlier, this city cable uh, presentation will be downloaded and it will be at the sites that I just mentioned very, very soon. And also, if you have a comment or a question, we have a comment and question sheets out fr outside. We'll collect them and we could get back to folks by way of these um, the websites. So before we leave 135 Dudley, I just want to um, express our thanks representing the PRC, the city, uh, to the applicants here who did the best they could to respond to the RFP objectives, uh, mission, vision that was put out in the request for proposal. So I don't want that to go uh, left unsaid. So, um, so yeah, so let me, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. The, the question is, is there going to be another meeting? So I'm going to jump ahead on the agenda because some folks might want to leave or they can't stick around. Next steps, um, we're going to have another meeting next week, same place, same time. We're going to be looking at two different uh, applications. One, it's going to be 40-50 Warren Street, and another is going to be the 2470, 2447 Washington Street. Um, we would then, uh, we're, D&D, BPGA is working with the Project Review Committee to continue our evaluation and review of the proposals. We're hoping to have a recommendation. That PRC recommendation um, would be going to the Roxbury Strategic Master Plan Oversight Committee for a pre presentation there. Okay, so the question is how is the information going to be distributed to the um, public? That's a great uh, point. We, we have uh, DND's website, our email list. We have Office of Neighborhood Services email list. We have the uh, BPGA email list. I think one of the advantages of having the sign-in sheet, with, if everyone puts in their email address, that's another direct way that we could reach out to folks 
to, to stay engaged. Okay. So, so the question is, um, a lot of folks don't have email. Uh, it's, so how can we um, ramp up our community engagement, I guess, uh, if you will, to make, make sure we get the, the, the word out by flyers? And that's something that we would, we would um, have to redouble our efforts on. Yeah. So, um, so the, anyway, the, just to continue the, the next steps, um, meeting with the Roxbury Strategic Master Plan Oversight Committee, they would um, hear the recommendation and upon that recommendation, since it's Department of Neighbor Development Land, ultimately the, the final recommendation is made by DND to our Public Facilities Commission, or in essence our Board of Directors, to make um, votes on land designations and, and other sort, but that, that would be the final step. So when we, when we walk through that, s that stage, we're looking at probably uh, late spring, summer where we would um, be reaching out to folks with that in mind. And I just want to keep in mind something that I mentioned earlier. Timing is, is important. Yes, the process, we're going to get this right. But to the extent that we could have the developer designations in the summer, early fall, it positions the applicants to uh, file applications at the Department of Housing and Community Development. And the unfortunate thing is they have a, a, an annual round once a year so if we can make it this year, that's a, that's a one-year time that we all, I think, would v value, given all the time that folks have been sp spending on the community process and stuff. If we miss that, if an applicant cannot apply in uh, February of 2020, one year would pass. So that's just, just something we want to we keep in mind. So anyway, we're, we'll close the section on 135. I want to thank the applicants. Let's have a, a, just a quick um, breakdown, and then we're going to go to 75-81 um, Dudley, and it would be Madison Park. It'd be the, the lone uh, applicant on this. Thank you very much.